the, the verse that I want to look at today is in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Just the first verse, Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's our, our verse today. And the title of the message is, Can You Be a Living Sacrifice? Can you be a living sacrifice? Um, you know, can, you put your, can you put yourself on the, on the altar? Every day. Be a living sacrifice. Every day of your life, a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, but a, a living sacrifice. When I, I don't know where I heard this. I don't know it was when, when I was in high school or whether it was a movie I heard. But there was a, a military man. And he said, the way you win wars is not by dying for your country. It's by letting... The enemy died for his country. <laughs> and that's kind of true. You know, we want to win people to, to, the, to the Lord. We have to live. I, I, I realize it's hard to think, but it's, it's easier to die for Jesus than it is to live for him. I mean, if, if somebody is going to say, well, you... You, um, you, want, you, you serve Jesus, well, I'm going to kill you. Well, go ahead. <laughs> I'll go on to glory. Yeah, right. but, but if I have to live for Jesus, that's a whole different story. I have to put my life on the altar. I have to put myself on the altar every day. I have to Amen. die daily. It, it makes me think of something else. When I was a young boy, I guess I was in 7th or 8th grade, I guess I was about 12 or 13 years old, I'd been taking a a judo class for about, I don't know, two years or so. And the, the teacher, who was just an old guy, it was not a real serious class, but we had about five or six guys in the class, and this teacher wanted, he wanted to put me in a competition. <laughs> well, all right, I said, all right, I'll go. Well, when we got to the, I mean, I was just, I wasn't even great. I wasn't a good person in judo. I had a yellow belt, I guess. And he said, well, you're ready to try some competition. So he took me to this meet. And when I get there, I see all the guys that are about my age and my size. Boy, these guys are tough. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, this is not going to be easy for me. These guys are serious. They, they really know judo. So I look up on the list and it's a double elimination. You know, you lose twice and you're out. I said, well, that's not too bad. <laughs> so um, they call my name, and the, the guy that I'm supposed to fight with, judo with, he comes out, boy, he grabs him, pow! <laughs> Ipan! You know, like they say, you, he won. Ipan means it's over, perfect throw. I'm on the ground. I figure <laughs> one down. <laughs> I, it didn't last long, and it, it didn't hurt that bad. <laughs> But then I realized i got to do this again. <laughs> and then I realized that the next guy I have to go against, yeah. <laughs> he's somebody that I know. He's the little brother of a guy I go to school with. <laughs> so I say, well, I can't just... <laughs> I mean, this first guy just threw me down, and it was over, and I was glad. I can't just, you know... Let this end that quick. This little brother, he's younger than me. He, I got to give it a try. So I got out there. He was much better than I was. But at least I tried. But pow, he threw me down. <laughs> it was over. But then I was like, whew. <laughs> it's over. I don't have to do it again. It only took two. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way it is. You know, if you, if you live for Jesus, you can't just go out there and die. You've got to die daily. You've got to put yourself on the altar every day. You know, it's, it's easier to, to die for Jesus than it is to really live for them. You know, and, and the Bible tells us that. You know, Romans 6.6 6 says, our old man is crucified with him. 
you know, nevertheless, we, you know, we, we're alive. Our old man is, the old man, the old sinful man is put to death, but, but we're still alive. Yep. Amen. But the old man is dead. And Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he says, I die daily. Yeah. You know, I mean, Paul knew what it meant to put his, his, his life on the altar. He knew what it meant to be a living sacrifice because he said, I die daily. So it's different every day. But I know one thing we've got to do, and that's we've got to put our old man to death. Our old sinful man has to be crucified. You've got to stop sinning. If you're going to put your life on the altar, that's the first thing. You've got to stop sinning. You can't do that anymore. Amen. You're living for the Lord. Amen. You're not sinning anymore. Yes. Amen? That's right. And then if you can, the second thing you really have to do is you have to live, live as Jesus taught us to live. And one of the things Jesus taught us to do, probably a most important thing, he taught us to love. And not just to love those who are easy to love, but to love, love your enemies. Amen. That's what Jesus said. So if you're going to put yourself on the altar, you're going to be a living sacrifice. You're going to have to love and you're going to have to love your enemies. Amen. And then Jesus said something else about how to love. He says, love as I have loved you. He said, I've given you a new commandment. To love one another as I have loved you. And he says, in first, well, it was, it's in John and it's in First John, you know. He says, I, as I have loved you. And how did Jesus love us? He laid down his life for us. In First John, verse 316, that's what he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So if you're going to follow Jesus and put yourself on the altar, you're going to have to love the way he did. You're going to have to lay down your life for the brethren. Which is the same thing as dying daily, because you're a sacrifice every day. But there's one more thing that you really need to do. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be a living sacrifice, if you're going to Die daily if you're going to put yourself on the altar every day. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, before Jesus ascended up to heaven, at the end of the Gospel of Luke, he, he told the apostles, he told the disciples, he said, tarry in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And he was talking about the 
the Holy Spirit. He was talking about the Holy Ghost. And he, and, he, and he said the same thing. In fact, it, it's Luke, Luke who wrote the, the book of Acts. You know, Jesus says the same thing in the beginning of the book of Acts. So Luke ends the gospel and then he picks it up with the same thing. He's ending the gospel of Luke. Luke ends his gospel with telling the disciples and telling us we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be endued with power from on high, because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have God's power in you, you're not going to be able to die daily. You're not going to be able to lay yourself on the altar every day. I'm just, I wanted to read that, because I want to just in, um, in Acts chapter 1, just so that we know, verses 4 and 5, and then verse 8. In verse 4 it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them, so Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So that's what I'm saying. If you want to live a crucified life, you want to be able to put your life on the altar, you want to be a living sacrifice, you have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You have to be filled with power from on high. Verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And you shall be witnesses. If that word witness in Greek is the same word martyr, you know, it's a, <laughs> so if you're going to be a martyr, which is dying, you know, a, a martyr, we think of a martyr as someone who died for Jesus. But if you're going to be a witness, you're going to have to be a martyr too. You're going to have to die daily. You're going to have to be able to, and you're going to need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So h- how do you know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I, I, the best way to know is that you've, you've done these three things. First, you've, you stop sinning. You know, you're, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be sinning. You're not going to be living a life of sin. Amen. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're probably going to love one another the way that Jesus loved. You're going to be able to love and even lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. And you'll also be able to die daily. So if you're not doing these things, if you're not, I mean, that, that's what happens to me. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I say I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but every once in a while I realize my flesh is not on the altar. You know, I'm not a living sacrifice. So how do I know I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit? The evidence of speaking in tongues. You said it, Sister Phyllis. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. If, if, you're, if you're not speaking in tongues and you're not living a perfect life, you may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Because most of the time we, we don't live the way we want to be. We just don't. We, but if we pray in tongues, then we know that we've asked the Lord to fill us with the Holy Spirit and He has. Right. So that's, that's the initial evidence that you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want to say. I think all of us need to know that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we, we, can't, we can't do what, what Paul is kind of commanding us to do in Romans, in Romans 12. I want to go back to that verse, and I want to look at it a little bit closer, since that is our text for today, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And we'll look at it a little bit closer, thinking about what we just talked about, you know. You know, Paul says, I beseech you. He's beseeching us. We think of the word beseech as meaning, you know, I'm urging you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. And that does make sense. That does make sense that, that um, Paul is, is kind of urging us. But I, when you see the word, the, the Greek word there, it's like the same word from the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the Greek word for the Holy Spirit is a, the para, paraclete which means one called near. This word beseech is para, parakelio, 
So it's kind of like the same root um, from the word of the Holy Spirit. When we think of the Holy Spirit, we don't think of urging or pleading. We think of comfort and exhorting. So if you take it that way, you can think that Paul is like comforting us. I'm comforting you. In fact, the, the, when we... Matthew 5, 4, it says, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's the same word here that's used to mean beseech. So, you know, there is some comfort in what Paul is saying. He's exhorting us to do something. He's encouraging us to do something. It's more than just begging us and pleading with us. He's, he's saying this, there's comfort in this. I'm exhorting you to do this. I'm exhorting you to... Um, be a living sacrifice. And then he says, therefore, you know, I beseech you, therefore. So there must have been something that made him say, therefore. I, I think what, if we go back just one verse, you know, from chapter 12, verse 1, to chapter 11, verse 36, for of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be the Glory forever. Amen. Therefore, that's what he's saying. So, you know, to God, of him and through him and for him are all things. So that's, that's why, that's why we should um, present our bodies as living sacrifices. Right? It's more than, more than than sometimes we think about. And then the next, the next part of that verse is interesting too. He says, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Well, that, that's, that's, it's almost like by the mercies of God, you, you want me to present my body a living sacrifice? It, it, it doesn't seem to, to flow there. Because when we think of mercy, I, I don't know if, if, if you remember... A couple of weeks ago when Brother Rusty was teaching about um, mercy, you know, that the mercy and the, gra the grace of God, when we were talking about the attributes of God, he, he was saying that mercy is um, not getting what we truly deserve, you know. When, when, when God gives us mercy, he doesn't give us what we truly deserve. We deserve hell, but because of his mercy, we get heaven. It's God's mercy. But, but the word here is not that same mercy. It's mercies. It's like plural, like feelings. So it's, it's, a, it's a different word. And it, it's really a different... It's feelings. It's compassion. You know, like, like when you use the word feeling, it's always plural. Feelings. You hurt my feelings, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that's what happens to, sometimes you're present your body a living sacrifice, and it hurts your feelings. Doesn't it? You know, well, but... Not what? Yeah, you, you, you feel like you got your feelings hurt sometimes. But, but it's really the word compassion. You know, um, God has compassion on it. So it's like saying, by the compassion of God. You know, that, 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 and that, the word compassion is a good word too. Because... Com means like with, C-O-M, with, or together, and with the suffering. So with the suffering of God, with the compassion of God. You know, the, Paul is letting us know that I'm, I'm, I'm beseeching you to do this, I'm exhorting you to do this, but it's, you're not alone. It's with the, the compassion of God. It's with, it's with God suffering along with you. And then it's the same thing again. That word, that, made, <clears throat> that word mercy could also mean, you know, the God of all comfort. That word there is comfort, like feelings. You know, we, 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 God feels for us as, a, as a, a relationship between God and us. And he, 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 he feels for us. He has compassion for us and he wants to comfort us. If you look at that word comfort, it's from two words, the same C-O-M, which means with, but it's with strength, with strength, with fortis. You know, the, the Greek word there is fortis, strength. So it's with strength. So he's saying, in, in, in that way, it might make a little 
little bit, it might flow a little better, bit better in our minds. You know, I beseech you, brethren, by the compassion of God, you know, that as you put yourself on the altar, God is with you. He's suffering with you. His compassion, you know. He feels your suffering. Or, or by the, the comfort of God, you know, as, you, as you're putting yourself on the altar, a living sacrifice, God's strength is there with you. So it, that encourages us as we go on and present our bodies, that we yield our body a, a living sacrifice. Which is kind of a strange thing too, a living sacrifice. Sacrifice means dead. You know, if you look, we, I mean, I'm looking at some of the words in the Greek. The, the, the root word for sacrifice means to slay or to kill. So a sacrifice is usually dead. We're, we're not to be dead sacrifices. We're to be living sacrifices. So, you're, you're, you know, looking at the, the Greek, sacrifice means dead, means slain. And, and the word sacrifice, which is a, from the Latin, sac, which means like sacer, or means holy, and facere, which means to make. So when, you, when you're a sacrifice, you make something holy. That, that's interesting, too, that we're to be a living sacrifice. We're to make our bodies a living sacrifice. Make, some, make, some, make our bodies holy. And then he even goes on to say that. You know, present your body a living sacrifice, holy. Holy. And holy means like a saint. As a saint, as a, as a saint has been made holy by the blood. We, we, we are saints. We're made holy by the, the blood of Jesus. Not that we're good in our own selves, but when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for us, and then he makes us holy by his blood. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Acceptable unto God. It means God is pleased. It's well-pleasing to God. You're acceptable to God. This is a good thing to do. Put your, you know, present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And that verse finishes, um, <clears throat> which is your reasonable service. It's not something <laughs> crazy. This is something reasonable. In fact, that word reasonable is from the same word as the, the word word. You know, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos. You know that? And, and, and that word logos also is from the word logical. You know, the word from the word logical, same root as the word logo. So it's logical to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And then the last part of that verse is, which is your reasonable service? Your reasonable service, your service. The idea of a, of a service, of ministry. You know, this is our, our worship service. That's what we call it. When you present your body a living sacrifice, it's a service of worship. In fact, that's the way... The New American Standard Version translates that, translates the end of that verse. It says, it's your spiritual service of worship. So when you present your body a living sacrifice, that's your spiritual service of worship. It's like a worship service. Presenting your body a living sacrifice is a, a, a worship service. It's a service of worship. Can you be a living sacrifice? Can you do that? Well, we, we need to know. Can we do it? How can we do that? We need a, a manual. We need a book that's going to tell us, or some instruction manual, a little how-to manual. What do I do? How do I present my body a living sacrifice? How, how do I lay myself down on the altar? You know, um, <clears throat> Abraham gives us a good lesson. Abraham gives us a real good lesson how to present our bodies a living sacrifice. When Abraham had to sacrifice his own son, if we would follow what Abraham did, it's kind of like a how-to manual, how to present your body a living sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22 is such a good, such a good, good chapter in the Bible. It's, a, it's a probably a very, 
well-known story where Abraham sacrifices Isaac on, on the altar. But it, it's, a, it's a little um, help manual for us to know how we can lay ourselves on the altar the way that Abraham laid his son on the altar. Gives us a little bit of a how to do it, how to do it. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, we'll see what Abraham did. Genesis 22, chapter, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. God did tempt Abraham. Well, I mean, it, really that God did prove Abraham. He tested him. He proved him. And I, we could say that about ourselves. You know, I've, I've been saved now or <laughs> two days. And it came to pass that after these two days, God did prove me. You know, he said, you're, sa- you're saying you're my child. You're saying that you want to serve me. Well, okay, prove it. And, and that's kind of what the Lord is telling Abraham. God did prove Abraham. And he said, Abraham, and Abraham said, Abraham said, here I am. Abraham was, he knew the voice of God. He heard, he heard God speak. And when God said, Abraham, he heard it. And he said, here I am. And then in verse 2, we see what the Lord tells Abraham to do. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Well, here's here's the test. Here we're going to see, can Abraham prove that he's going to obey whatever God tells him to do? And it's, it's real interesting here, because he says, Take thine only son. Well, we know that Abraham wasn't Isaac's, Abraham, <clears throat> Isaac wasn't Abraham's only son. He had another son, Ishmael. But here, the word only means your, your dear son, your darling son. The, 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 the most precious thing you have. The most precious thing you have. Whom thou lovest. When you do Bible studies, or when you, they call it hermeneutics, when you study the Bible, there's a doctrine of first use. And that's always to see where does God put a word in the Bible, the first time it's in the Bible, the doctrine of first use. And here we see the first time the word love is in the Bible. Right here, this is the first time the word love is in the Bible. Whom you love. So it shows you how, you know, you're going to sacrifice what you love the most to prove that you love me. Showing how important this, this is, how important this, this love is, and how important Isaac was to Abraham. Because he's saying, what you love most, lay it down. Lay it down. You have to... Put it on the altar. He's telling us that. Just looking at another time that that word only is used there. It's it's used to mean darling in in the Psalms. In Psalm 22, verse 20, it says, you know, my, my protect my darling from the from the dogs. <laughs> What he's saying is protect me. He's protect my darling myself. Because in, in the New King James, it says protect my precious life from the dog. So that, that, that's kind of what this word only means here. We think it means only, but it's more like darling, dearest, which is so precious to you. Something you dearly love. He's saying to put that on the altar. Put it on the altar. So what does Abraham do in verse 3? Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took his two young men with him 
and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. So what does God do? And what does Abraham do? Exactly what God tells him to do. He doesn't even hesitate. He doesn't even think about it. He gets up early and does exactly what God tells him to do. He didn't think. He didn't hesitate. There was really nothing else he could do because he knew God. He knew who God was. And he didn't have to think because if God told him to do it, he wasn't going to hesitate. And that's what he does. He gets up early, does exactly what God tells him to do because he knew God and he knew the voice of God. He knew if God spoke, that's what he should do. He had to obey it. Let's continue reading. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse 5, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Well, a couple of things we can look at right here. No, he says he took his young men, so you think these young men are, they sound like they're young men. But that's the same word used, young men, is lad. So, Isaac is, is a young man too. He's not like a little tiny boy. He could be a young teenager to a boy, to a man maybe 30 years old. So, he's a, he's a young man, just like the young men that go with Abraham. So, he's not a little baby. Sometimes we think of Isaac as a, a child, but Isaac isn't a child here. Isaac's a young man. And then, if you remember, what it says right here, and it's interesting that the way he says this, he says, I and the lad, or I and Isaac, will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. So, Abraham knew that even though he was told to sacrifice Isaac, Isaac was coming back. Because he knew God wouldn't break the promise that he'd given to him. If, if he had to sacrifice Isaac, God was going to bring him back to life. Because God had made such promises about Isaac, and God wasn't going to break his promise. And he, even from the beginning of the, the story of Abraham in chapter, chapter 12, you know, Chapter 12, verse 2, the Lord tells Abraham, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was the promise that God made to Abraham. And he made that same promise again in chapter 15. Verses 5 and 6, chapter 15. Is that, am I right? Or am I reading my notes wrong? Maybe not. Maybe I'm reading. Maybe I'm reading. Maybe I'm reading my notes. Maybe it's verse 17. I don't know. I must. I, sometimes my notes get confused, so I apologize. It's five and six. Five and six. Well, yeah, he does. At verse five, he said, And he brought him forth abroad and said, And look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. So Abraham knew that from, from Isaac, or from his seed, that he'd, he'd have many, many children. And then the same promises again in chapter 17. Let me see. I want, I want to read it to... Yes, because this is where he specifically says. He says, but my covenant, you know, he tells Abraham that Sarah is going to have a child. Verse 19, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear a son. Indeed, and thou shalt be called... In, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. So Abraham knew that God promised 
that the covenant was from the, the sons of Isaac, not the sons of Ishmael. That's what he... That's what he said. But my covenant, verse 21, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this time next year. So Abraham knew that if, if he would sacrifice Isaac, God was going to have to restore Isaac. He wasn't going to let him, wasn't going to let that promise end. So let's continue. I think that's, you know, God made a promise. God had a covenant with, with Abraham and God knew that, Abraham knew that God's word was, was true and he, God wouldn't break his promise. Let's continue reading in chapter 22 about Abraham. So, verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac. Oh, boy, is that a picture? He took the wood and laid it upon Isaac, his son. God the Father laid a cross of wood on Jesus. So we see a picture there of Jesus in, in, in Isaac. You need to remember that you know, God the Father, as we're going through trials and ten- testing and being proven, we need to remember that God laid the cross on, on His Son Jesus, that Jesus died for us. It might seem difficult. Sometimes we say, I'm going through trials. The Lord is testing me. It's a severe test. But we have to remember... Just to, I'm going to flip back to Romans, and I'm going to read what it says in Romans 8, 31. It says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. When, when it's difficult, when it seems that God is proving you, remember that God gave His Son. Amen. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with us freely give us all things? So as we're being proven on the altar, as we're being a living sacrifice, we have to remember that God gave us his son. Who can be against us? Let's continue reading. In verse 7, it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? He said, Oh, we have fire, we have wood, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? We're going to have a sacrifice. And again, if we (laughs) look... The doctrine of first use is right here again. This is the first time lamb is mentioned in the Bible. This is the first, the first time the word lamb is mentioned in the Bible is right here. A lamb for the burnt offering. Another picture of, of Jesus. In fact, the next verse says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide a lamb. Well, we, we can, maybe that's, you could read it that way. God's going to provide a lamb. We can go up on this hill and sacrifice. Abraham says to Isaac, we can go sacrifice because God himself is going to provide a lamb for us. So we don't have to bring the lamb. God's going to provide the lamb. Or maybe we read it, God will provide a lamb for himself. You know, this, this is a sacrifice for God, so God's going to provide a lamb for himself. Or we could read it this way. God himself will be the lamb. You know, that's, what, that's a good way to read it. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. That God will be the lamb for the sacrifice. So we need to, that's, that's a good way to read that verse. That God will be the lamb. The Lord Jesus will be the lamb. So if we think of that, when, when we're on the altar, 
We're crucified with Christ. The Lord's with us. When we're going through trials, when we put our, our life on the altar, when we put ourself on the altar, when we're a living sacrifice, it's really Christ with us in the altar. Christ in us on the altar. Amen. Uh, that that kind of goes back to what we were talking about in Romans chapter 12, where it's the mercies of God, you know, the, the compassion of God, the comforting of God, that when we're presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, God's there with us. Jesus is there with us. We're not alone. We're not alone on the altar. Jesus is there with us. In fact, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. Like the song we said, it's always been you, Jesus. It always is you, Jesus. When I'm on the altar, it's you, Jesus. When I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice, it's you. Verse 9, we're continuing in Genesis chapter 22, verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told, her, told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on, on the altar, upon the wood. So again, we see that Isaac is laid on the wood. He's laid on the altar. He's laid on the wood, just as, as Jesus was, was laid on the cross. But it says he bound, he bound Isaac. Now, I mean, Isaac is kind of going along with this. He's, he's not resisting. We don't read anywhere that Isaac is saying, hey, wait a second, wait a second, Dad, what's going on here? There's no, no argument, no fighting. Isaac is just yielding to, he's yielding himself a living sacrifice. But, but, but before... Abraham puts Isaac on the altar. He binds him. He takes authority over. Sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to bind whatever's keeping us from laying ourselves on the altar. We have to bind it. Maybe it's a spirit of anger or a spirit of fear or spirit of self. You've got to bind that in Jesus' name. You've got to tie it up. Then you can put it on the altar. Then you can sacrifice it. So it's interesting, too, that Abraham had to bind Isaac before he put him on the, on the altar. Amen. We also have to remember that when God does call us to put ourselves on the altar, um, 1 Corinthians 10.13 ought to be in the back of our mind. Because, you know, Abraham had to do something that seemed impossible to do. I mean, I, how many, how many mothers, how many fathers could obey God? I mean, how, how, even to, to putting yourself on the altar. You, you need the Holy Spirit. And you need to know it's God talking to you. But you also need to know that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.13, there's no temptation taking you. There's no trial. There's no proving. Proving but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, to be proved above that you are able, but will with the temptation, with the temptation, with the testing, with the proving, he'll make a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it. So you've got to remember that. When you feel like this is impossible, Lord, go with, go with what, what the Lord says. Obey the Lord, because you know the Lord is going to provide a way. It's, going to be, it's not going to be as hard as you think because God's going to provide a way. Amen. Well, let's continue on. It says, in Abraham, verse 10, Genesis 22, verse 10, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So he was going to do it. He was going to slay his son. He knew God was going to raise him up, but he was still going to obey. He said, I, I'm, I know God's not going to let this be the end of me. I know God's not going to let everything you promised. Whatever God promises to you, it's going to come true. God made a promise to you and you heard the voice of God. No matter what happens, he's not going to break that promise. So Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And verse 11 says, And the angel of the Lord 
called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. You know, he was... He said, yeah. He says, I know, verse 11, I know that you fear God. Verse 11 and 12, I know now that you fear... Well, God, God knew what Abraham was going to do. God knows everything. It, it, it wasn't like God was saying, I'm, I'm going to put Abraham to this test, and I've got to see whether he's going to pass it or not. Right. God knew. God knew ahead of time. Amen. But Abraham didn't know. Yeah. Abraham didn't know if he was going to get through this. And often that's the case with us. You know, the Lord is testing us, but it's proving us to ourselves. You know, after Abraham does this, he knows no matter what God tells him to do, he's going to be able to do it. You know, he says, no matter what God tells me now, and that's the same thing with us. When God puts us through a test and we get through, we succeed, we know, well, now I can, now I can do whatever God tells me to do. I can do it and I will do it. Whatever God wants me to do. Well, I, I, that's what it says. He says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For I now know, verse 12, For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me, thine only, thy precious, which most precious to you, which most precious to him. He says, You haven't withheld that from me. And then what happens is there's something kind of, you know, Abraham looks behind him. Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. God made a way. Just like we read in 1 Corinthians, God made a way. That he could follow him, that Abraham could do a sacrifice and do exactly what God wanted him to do. God made a way to escape, that he would be able to bear it. But it's interesting, too, that there wasn't a lamb caught in the bushes. There wasn't a lamb. It was a ram. You know, a lamb is gentle and peaceful and easy, but it's a ram. <laughs> you know, a ram. In fact, the, the word ram is from the same root word of strength and strong. You know, this ram wasn't, it didn't want to be put to death. But God took care of that. God had him in the bushes stuck and he couldn't get his head out. You can just imagine, well, Abraham says, this is going to be easy. God has already bound the ram for me. All I have to do is go kill it. That's, that's also a picture what you know, God does for us. Sometimes we think, I, I can never do what God asked me to do. But that's a, something so strong in me, I'm never going to be, I love my enemy. No way, I can't do that. But, 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 but God binds up that hate in you, you know. I want to hate my enemy. God tells me to love my enemy, but then you serve God and he binds up that hatred, that anger. And, and you can do what he tells you to do. That's, that's like a picture of the ram there. You know, that, that strong ram that wouldn't be the sacrifice is already bound, bound up. God has bound it up. Amen. All you have to do is obey God yep. and sacrifice it. And the funny thing, it was there all the time. It says he looked behind him and there was that, that ram. Just... Sometimes that's the way it is. We think this is going to be impossible. I'm never going to get out of this. There's no way I'm going to... And you just say, the Lord opens your eyes and you say, there it is right there. What God wanted me to do, it seemed so impossible. And there it was right there for me to obey, to sacrifice. It wasn't even, a, it wasn't even difficult for him after he got through the, the difficulty. You know, after, you, after the Lord puts you on the altar after you present your body a living sacrifice, you say, ah, the Lord made a way. It wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. 
Amen. 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 Verse 14, it says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. It shall be seen. God was going to see to it. God was going to see that there was a sacrifice there. Jehovah Jireh. Our God provides. Our God provides. God provided the lamb. You know, sometimes we, we take that verse, you know, that in it, when we're praying for something we need, you know, we, we kind of mix it in with Philippians 4.19. You know, but my God shall supply all of your need. And we take that verse, God is my provider. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more than providing our needs. You know, it's that God provided a lamb. God provided a ram. God provides a way to, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, to live for Him. To put ourselves on the altar every day, to die daily, to take up our cross daily and follow Him. You know, God provides. God provides a way that we can do that. And it's all Jesus. You see, sometimes we think, it's me. I'm, I'm putting myself on the altar. I'm dying. No, no, no. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. Let's continue, continue reading and finish up this, you know, finish up this chapter. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time. So this is tw- the angel of the Lord, that, that's a, a good thing to look at there too. Because when God spoke to Abraham in chapter 1, it probably was just a voice in his heart, you know. We, we don't see an angel of the Lord. But here... In verse 15 and also in verse 11, as an angel of the Lord, something came and appeared to Abraham. And it says an angel of the Lord, but that angel is not an angel. Because if we keep reading, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord. So that that angel of the Lord was the Lord himself. That could be a picture of Jesus. You know, a picture of Jesus the Lord. Because we can see that it's not just an angel, but it's God himself. Because he says in verse 16, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord. So, and then what does God, God swearing by himself, because what else can God swear by? There's nothing bigger than God, God so God has to swear by himself. And then he makes a, a promise again. To Abraham. The same promise he's made all along. He said that in blessing, I will bless thee. Verse 17. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And in thy seed, and thy seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nation of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Verse 18. So there we, God makes that same promise to Abraham that he made in the beginning, in the middle, and now here at at this time too. God's promising that he's going to bless Abraham and bless his seed. How does that relate to us? When we lay our, our lives on the altar, when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, when we lay it all down, Lay it all down. Sacrifice ourselves. God promises He'll bless us. And He'll use us. He'll use us to bring Jesus. I mean, that that was the promise to Abraham that in Abraham, in thy seed, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was a promise of a Messiah. That was a promise of the Savior. That was a promise of Jesus. That God promises to bring Jesus through us. That we will be a, a, a witness. That's what, that's what it is. A witness is a martyr laying down your life. That we'll be a witness for Jesus. That well, Christ will be manifested. That well, people will get saved. You'll be able to preach Jesus. When you lay it all down, when you present your body a living sacrifice. Well, I just want to end with one thought before we 
finish. Because <clears throat> Abraham was called to sacrifice what he loved most. It wasn't just his son, but it was the promise that God had given him. That from, from him, from him, a Messiah would come, a Savior would come. What do we love most? What's the thing we love most? What, what has God given you that you love most? Time? Well, could be. God's given us a lot of time. Money? Maybe God gave you a lot of money. Your job? Your family? Has God given you a great family, a great home? Is that what you love most? You know, you know we, what could it be? What, what, what is the greatest thing that God's given us? Jesus. What? Jesus. Jesus. Eternal life. Salvation. That's what God has, has given us. And we're not called to sacrifice that. We're not called to sacrifice our eternal life. We're not got, called to... But Moses and Paul both were willing to do it. Did you know that? Both Moses and Paul were willing to get their names blotted out of the book of life. For, for their people. If you if you read, I mean, it's just such a... Such a, a, a powerful thing for a person to, it, it, you know, we read in Moses in chapter, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses, Exodus chapter 32, where this is, this is the story where, you know, Moses is up on the, the mount and God gives the Ten Commandments and the people are down waiting and waiting and they're waiting for Moses to come back and Moses doesn't come back so the people tell they. Tell Aaron, Aaron, make us a god. So Aaron makes a golden calf and they're worshiping the golden calf. And then Moses hears all this going on. And Moses is angry and God is angry and God wants to judge the people. God wants to wipe them out. Exodus chapter 32, verse 31. Let's, let's start in verse 30. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. And then in verse 32, Exodus 32, 32. Now yet, if thou wilt... He says, now, get now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. He says, forgive them. If And if not, blot me. Blot me, I pray thee. Out of thy book, which thou hast written. So, forgive them. If you, if you can't forgive them, then take me out of your book. He was willing to give it all up, even eternity. Blot me out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Blot out of my book. So, But Moses was willing. He was willing to... Be blotted out of the book of life for his people. And then Paul says the same thing. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 9. If you want to just flip there, I can read it. Romans chapter 9, where Paul is praying for his people. Yeah, verse, well, we can start with verse 1. It says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great sorrow and continue, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He has great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to their flesh. You know, Paul is here saying, I, 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 I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ, for my brethren, for my kinsmen. He's willing to be blotted out of the book of life like Moses was for the salvation of his brethren, for the salvation of his family. Well, we know that's not something that happened. <laughs> you know, God didn't blot out the blot out Moses or Paul from the book of life. They're in eternal heaven receiving their reward. But it just goes to show to, to, the, 
to the extent that these men were willing to sacrifice for the salvation of their family. To be a living sacrifice for their family. Well, just, just to end there, you know, to um, knowing that God does promise to save our family. That's a promise that God promises. And um, if we, we do what he tells us, just as Abraham was willing to lay it all on the altar, and God's promise was that he would save his people, that he would give him a people. That's, a, that's the promise to us too. That we are, we are willing to be a living sacrifice so present it all on the altar. In God's mercy, he, he, he lets us do it, helps us to do it. Makes a way that we can do it. Provides a way that we can do it. And then, I mean, it seems like the, the um, outcome of that is people get saved. So, Amen. 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 So, let's pray then before, before we end. And if anyone has a need that we can pray for, you want us to lay hands on you. You want us to agree with you in prayer. Let us pray with you. Well, let's, let's close with prayer. Father, we, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for your, your compassion, for your comforting. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we do lay ourselves on the altar, when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, that you're there with us. We're thankful that we know that, Heavenly Father, that nothing's too difficult, that you're willing to give your Son for us, that nothing's too difficult, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you that we can stand in your promise that you'll save our family. We thank you that you are so faithful in your word, that your promises are always true. We thank you, we thank you, Lord, that you do always make a way. You always make a way that we can obey you as we present our bodies to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, don't clap. I don't like clap. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just remember that it's a crucified life. It's not. Amen.